Lundry Prospect, welcome to RTB 2021 for August the 29th, 2021. Hope you're doing well on this Sunday. Hope you have a wonderful day of worship today. And uh, what a great time it is just to gather with the church body and to, to worship and fellowship and encourage one another. Uh, so we hope we have a good day uh, today. Hope you have a good day today. Uh, and a day of rest as well. So uh, our text for today, we have uh, 1 Samuel. Uh, 21 and 22, so two chapters in Samuel today uh, that are related to each other. And then we have 1 Corinthians 3, then we have uh, Ezekiel 1, we're starting the book of Ezekiel, uh, which I'm excited about, and then Psalm 37. Uh, so why don't we start with, uh, we'll start with 1 Corinthians 3. Uh, so this is a, a text, of course, again, Paul addressing the church at Corinth. We've talked about this uh, passage before, so I'm not going to hit on everything in the text, but again, Paul just to kind of give you a, an overview of this text is warning the Corinthians against judging their leaders based on human wisdom instead of God's wisdom. He's reminding them, uh, uh, exhorting them against factions uh, following one person or the other, because ultimately they are, uh, it's, it's not uh, Paul or Apollos that grows the church. It's God who grows uh, the church and not human leaders. Uh, Paul reminds them that there's no room for these rivalries that are causing dissensions and a lack of unity within the church. And uh, in fact, all leaders are building on the single foundation, uh, which is Jesus Christ himself. And that's building up. He uses this, this analogy of God's temple uh, as uh, an illustration of, of God's people, his, his church, which I think is a helpful illustration because, of course, um, it, it fits with that unified building analogy, right? We're all part of one building, uh, just as all, we're all part of one body. Uh, it's also, of course, the the temple was the place of God's presence in the Old Testament. It's the place of God's rule. Uh, and so we are part of a, a, a body of Christ. We're part of a group of people who are, um, who, who have, because of God's grace, God's presence among us, and God's rule among us, and that should characterize us as God's people, and that should bring unity. Uh, Paul argues for that church at Corinth, and I think that's true for every other local church as well. So uh, I, an important passage I, here, I think, for understanding the nature of, of the local church and the church universal as well here in 1 Corinthians 3. Uh, we'll move over to, we'll go, why don't we go over to Psalm 37. So Psalm 37 is another one of the wisdom psalms. We had one yesterday as well in Psalm 36. This is a rather unique one because it is actually a um, kind of a, a modified acrostic. It's not a full one, but it kind of um, bounces. Uh, it actually, the, the acrostic goes from in the odd verses. Uh, so one, three, and, and so on and so forth. Are, that's where the acrostic is found. Uh, so, so it's kind of a partial acrostic here, I guess you could say. And it's a collection of, of wisdom psalms. You'll find a, or wisdom uh, sayings, I guess you could say. You can find a lot of similar things in the book of Proverbs uh, that you find in, in uh, this, uh, this psalm. Uh, probably the most well-known is uh, what we find in verse 3 through 5. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Uh, delight in the Lord, and, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will do it. Um, I like that, that, uh, that verse there, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Does that mean that, you know, we're going to get everything that we want in life? Obviously not, but, um, what is our delight? Well, if we delight in the Lord, he will honor that delight, right? He will give us himself, which is ultimately what we should be desiring above all things. Kind of what we were talking about with Psalm 63 this, uh, past week in our, in our sermon. Uh, where you know, David was talking about how he was thirsting and after God in a dry and weary land where there is no water, that, that hit, God's love is better than life. Uh, in the midst of all that David was facing, there was nothing that was better than, than the presence of God, than the, uh, the person of God, the glory of God, the love of God. All these things were more valuable. Uh, and so David had delighted himself in the Lord and God had rewarded that that delight by giving him himself. And that's a, a good, um, I think, a uh, good uh, exhortation and encouragement for us this day, even as we uh, go uh, to church and worship, to go to, to, uh, to, the, to worship with our local body of Christ, New Prospect Baptist Church, and to 
uh, gather together. What are we doing? We are we're gathering together as a as a church to uh, exalt and to uh, delight ourselves in the Lord. So, Psalm thirty seven. Move over to First Samuel twenty one and twenty two. This is actually a text I talked about in relation to a psalm uh, that we uh, looked at a few weeks ago. And this is a, the story of when David is, again, fleeing from Saul, and he goes and he uh, flees to uh, a priest named Ahimelech uh, at a place called Nob, and, or Nov in the Hebrew, and then um, and he ends up taking some of the consecrated bread, and he is assisted by this priest Ahimelech. Uh, he kind of lies to the priest, well, not kind of, he does lie to the priest, telling him that, uh, that he's just been sent on there by this, by Saul himself on this secret mission. I think Ahimelech suspects this, obviously. And it, as it turns out, uh, there's a representative of Saul there, um, who is uh, Doeg, who the, he's an Edomite, who's a chief of Saul's shepherds, who just so happens to be at that same place and witnesses David receiving this assistance from Ahimelech. Um, and of course, this will end up, uh, and David, uh, I think, even admits to knowing that he knows that this is Saul's representative, even though, um, and, and, and he still uh, asks for, for help and, and doesn't do anything about it. And so this is going to end up in some bad, uh, with some bad results here in chapter 22. But before we get there, uh, David, after he receives from Ahimelech, the consecrated bread. By the way, this is used by uh, Jesus in Matthew 12. If you want to check that out, he refers to this text in Matthew 12, uh, verse 4, uh, where David receives the consecrated bread. And this is in the conversation that Jesus has with the Pharisees um, and uh, regarding the, uh, it's a debate on, upon the, sa on the Sabbath. And Jesus, by comparing um, he and his followers with David and his followers is basically saying that he is the Davidic Messiah. Um, but anyway, David, after he receives the bread and he also receives Goliath's sword, um, which had probably been uh, given to this, this, uh, this holy place, this place of, of worship where all these priests were uh, by David himself. Um, he receives the sword to defend himself, and he flees. He ends up going, of all places, and we talked about this in the sermon a few weeks ago, to Gath, uh, the place where Goliath was from. <laughs> so he's, he is so desperate that he's willing to go even to uh, his enemies to try to find refuge from Saul. Um, and of course, uh, the, the people of Gath are saying, isn't this the guy that's, that the people proclaim slain his, his thousands and, or his ten thousands? And of course, the ten thousands that David had slain were the Philistines, the people of Gath. Uh, so this is the height of desperation, right? Where, where uh, David is willing to flee even to uh, his enemies to escape from, from Saul. Well, he has to feign madness in order to, uh, to avoid being imprisoned and killed by uh, the Philistines, and ultimately he's able to flee again. Um, Saul finds out from um, Doeg that, that Ahimelech has assisted David, and he ends up killing all the priests uh, that were with Ahimelech there at Nob. Um, and a number of things are shown here. I mean, obviously, David is at fault. He admits this at the end of this chapter, but of course, ultimately, uh, it is Saul who is losing his, his mind, and he's even willing to attack uh, these representatives of God. Uh, so this is not just an attack on David. This is an attack on God himself, uh, and Saul is rapidly um, reaching an end here uh, because of, of his uh, of his crazy jealousy and his rejection from God. So that's 1 Samuel 21 and 22. And then finally, we get to the book of Ezekiel, uh, one of uh, the strangest books in the Bible, one of the strangest prophets in the Bible, uh, but also one of the more powerful books in the Bible. 
Um, our knowledge of Ezekiel actually only comes from his book. We don't know much about him from any, any other place, but he is one of the most creative, the strangest of the writing pro prophets. His messages were even restricted to adults uh, in Jewish tradition. Um, Dan Block, my mentor, uh, was one who did quite a bit of research on uh, Ezekiel. In fact, he wrote two commentaries. In fact, I can show you those real quick. Um, here are they. Yeah. Two commentaries about this size on the book of Ezekiel. Spent 11 years, spent 11 years of his life studying the book of Ezekiel. Uh, so I actually had a um, had an opportunity to study with him uh, with, with a lot of these. Uh, well, I had a, a seminar on the book of Ezekiel, and that was just a, a wonderful time to study this, this wonderful book. It is, uh, it is complex as well, and yet it has a very clear message, I think. Uh, ultimately, by the way, Block says about Ezekiel, while other prophets often acted erratically, Ezekiel is in a class by himself. And you'll see that as you read through this text. It's, uh, some have labeled him even a true psychotic, psychotic uh, suffering from paranoia, paranoia and schizophrenia and things like that, delusions. Um, and, you know, he has a bunch of bizarre acts as we go throughout the, uh, the book of Ezekiel. He's, he uh, lies bound and naked on the ground. He digs holes in the walls of houses. He, uh, he has emotional paralysis at his wife's death. He has spiritual travels. He has images of strange creatures that we even see in chapter one that we're going to look at today. But really, the, uh, the, the, uh, the message of Ezekiel is one that arises out of the same historical situation that we talked about with Jeremiah. Now, I'm not going to hit on that again, but uh, this is the context of, of exile. Now, Ezekiel is a little bit different from Jeremiah. Remember, Jeremiah stayed for the most part in Jerusalem until he was removed after the exile to go to, to Egypt. Ezekiel was actually taken into exile himself, 597 BC. So that's about a, that's 11 years before the ultimate fall of Jerusalem. So this was when the Babylonians came in in 597, made an incursion into Judah. They had actually made one in 605 BC. That's when um, Daniel was and, and his friends and, and other uh, officials were taken into exile in, in 605 BC, 20 years before the final fall of Jerusalem. Then the Babylonians made another incursion in 597 BC uh, to, to get the Jewish people under control. Uh, and they took some more people into exile, including Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a priest uh, at the time, but he and uh, and he wasn't even called as a prophet uh, until probably about four or five years in being in exile. So five years after being taken into exile is finally when he is called uh, into the prophetic ministry. And his last prophetic oracle was probably around 571 BC. So he was a prophet served in that prophetic role for only about 20 years, but we have quite a bit of prophecies in our book of Ezekiel uh, that, uh, that we have preserved for us today. Um, and so he is a prophet of the exile. He's prophesying then uh, in the majority of his book, probably the first 33 uh, chapters of this book are prophesying of the eventual uh, destruction of Jerusalem and the, the final judgment of God that's going to come uh, very shortly in the history of Israel. So uh, 586 BC. So if he started his prophetic ministry in 592, six years later is when the fall of Jerusalem occurs. And he's able to actually witness that, uh, that fall of Jerusalem through a spiritual vision, even while he's in Babylon. Um, but he's receiving all these pro prophetic utterances and these prophetic messages, even while he's in exile. So he's not in Jerusalem at all and will never return to Jerusalem, uh, even while he's um, receiving these prophetic messages. So what about Ezekiel 1? Well, as you read through Ezekiel 1, uh, you will see this is his call into the prophetic ministry. And it's one of the strangest call narratives that we'll have in, in scripture. Uh, it's pretty fearsome. It's a vision, a heavenly vision, of, of God himself uh, and appearing to Ezekiel. And as you read through it, it's especially evident in the Hebrew uh, that there, it's choppy language. It's uh, even some grammatical issues in there. It's almost as if Ezekiel is writing with a shaking hand. 
uh, because of this fearsome vision that he receives. Um, he's looking, and, and, and here's the way to, I think, to interpret this vision in Ezekiel 1. Um, you have a lot of, of symbolic things that, that uh, are being reported here. Very similar, in, the, in fact, to the book of Revelation. In fact, Revelation borrows some of this language uh, that we find in Ezekiel 1 and 2 um, and 3. But I think a good way of, of interpreting something like this, a very difficult text like this, is to step back and to see what seems to be emphasized through the imagery that is being described. So as you read through this, uh, you will see, for instance, that um, you have certain things being emphasized in, the, in this vision. So Ezekiel has, we'll, we'll start with uh, verse 4, where this storm wind comes from the north, a great cloud. So remember, he's in, he's in Babylon when he receives this vision. By the way, he's at the river Kabar, uh, where the Babylonians have apparently settled many of the Jews at this particular river, probably one of the inland, um, one of the irrigation canals connecting the Tigris Euphrates River to help with irrigation to help with uh, providing water to the people of the population of Babylon. Uh, so this is where they're settled. And while he's there, he sees this great cloud, the storm wind flashing forth. And this will be something you see throughout the, the brightness and the flashes and the fire um, of this vision of, of God uh, speaks of the glory of God. Uh, he will see things that are, uh, he mentions, quite a bit of, of gems and jewels uh, throughout. Uh, this also speaks of the glory of God. Then he has this, this vision of uh, these four living beings uh, that um, were in the flashes of fire, glowing metal. And their appearance, they had human form. They had four faces and four wings. So here's another thing that's being emphasized, the number four all the way through. Uh, four faces, four wings, the four, um, the four points, ultimately the four points of the compass is I think what's being emphasized here. And what, why is this being emphasized? It's, it's emphasizing God's freedom of motion, right? Even when he's in Babylon, you know, this is, this is striking, right? That God would be um, revealing himself outside of Jerusalem. Uh, and this is part of Ezekiel's point, I think is that God is not tied just to the temple in Jerusalem. In fact, his glory is about to leave the temple in Jerusalem to allow it to be destroyed. Uh, but he is, he's with his people here, at, even in Babylon. He has that freedom of motion. He can go wherever he wants. He's not uh, confined just to Jerusalem. He can go even to Babylon to be with his people. Um, and so that freedom of motion is emphasized by this number four. You also see it with the, the wheels uh, that are going are going to appear that are underneath the throne here in just a, me, a moment. As you read through the text, you see those wheels. And again, it's it's actually a weird picture because it's wheels within wheels, but it's showing, showing again, freedom of motion. It can, they can go wherever they want. And the four faces of these angelic beings show that they can go wherever they want. In fact, they don't turn their heads when they move. So they kind of doing this number. It's kind of a weird uh, picture, fearsome picture, obviously. Uh, another thing that's emphasized in this text is, of course, the uh, the power of uh, God, and this is seen in those those creatures. So the creatures have those four faces, right? One is a human. Uh, one has the appearance of a lion. One has the appearance of an eagle. One has the appearance of a bull, or an ox. And of course, these are the uh, the most powerful animals within those categories, whether it's humans, uh, the swiftness and mobility of an eagle, the strength and majesty of a lion, the raw power of a bull, and the wisdom and reason of humankind, and all these things are representative of the power that God himself has, uh, and it points to, I think, the judgments to come. Uh, in latter chapters, the same chariot will take the glory of God out of the, the temple of God, so um, step back, and see the picture of God that comes forward from this vision. It's a God who can go wherever he wants, who has all power, and who has all glory. And this glory is appearing to, to Ezekiel to call him into the prophetic ministry. But as with all call narratives, 
this vision imprints itself on Ezekiel, on his mind, and uh, it will affect every other prophecy that he makes in this, in this book. Uh, so I know this is a challenging chapter here, and it's a challenging book, but just kind of step back and, and see how it hits you. And I think um, it's a, to apply it to today, it's a helpful corrective, I think, to, uh, to the kind of domesticated picture of God that we often have in pop Christian circles. Uh, this is a God who, who is not confined, who is more powerful than we can imagine, more glorious than we can imagine. Uh, and that's a helpful thing, I think, to, to meditate on on a regular basis, but especially on a day like today, the Lord's Day, August 29th, 2021. Hope you have a great rest of the day.